Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining for uh, SIG Windows Maintainer Talk. Uh, my name is Claudio Bello. Uh, I am a senior cloud engineer at Cloud-based Solutions, and I am one of the tech leads for SIG Windows. And we are going to do a very short retrospective of uh, what happened uh, from the last cycle. And some additional um, guides on how to build Windows images, uh, different tips and tricks, and some very niche uh, tricks that you could use. Uh, this came up because um, there were quite a few uh, questions regarding how to build the best Windows images you can possibly do. So that's why uh, I'm here. We've been doing this for a couple of years, so we have a bit of knowledge and experience regarding this. And in the end, uh, I'm gonna try to recruit you, recruit you to join SIG Windows. We are a fun, loving community, so you're always uh, welcome to join us. So, minor updates. Um, we welcome Amim Naben uh, from Broadcom as one of our new tech leads for SIG Windows. He worked a lot on uh, Windows operation, uh, operational readiness, which is a standard of um, tests and things which should pass and work properly uh, in any Windows environment to certify that indeed it's working as intended and properly. And he also worked for uh, Windows DevTools, which are very useful to getting new contributors into Kubernetes space and especially for Windows. And we thank Jay Vias for all his contribu uh, contributions. He has been uh, great help for us, and he has been a very pleasant um, presence at any conference and meetings and so on. One other important thing to note is that the no log query feature will be entering beta in 1.30. We have a couple of other updates. Uh, we've in been improving the Windows operation readiness and Windows Dev Tools, and we have a few other things in the pipeline, so they're not yet ready to be announced, though. But let's go to the main thing for today, which is the Windows image building deep dive. So a little bit of context, uh, what we're gonna see here. We basically added a lot of um, Windows support for a lot of Kubernetes images, uh, the pause image, the Kube proxy image, the CNI, CSIs, and so on. So in most scenarios, we basically had to integrate those images into whatever uh, build processes Kubernetes already had. So there were quite a few restrictions on how we were gonna build the images. But we're gonna go from scratch, from zero, from the most basic images that you could possibly build to more complex, which are currently employed in Kubernetes image building processes and release processes. Okay, so. One important thing to note from start is that there are two types of images for Windows, uh, and they are gonna be used very differently and be built very differently. First of all, we have host process container images and regular workload container images, your usual images, right? The idea for host process containers is that they are a special type of containers which are basically run on the host itself and has access to all the networking devices, storage devices, the PCI devices, so on, uh, as any other type of service on the host itself would have. So that's very useful for um, things like deploying your CNIs, your CS, uh, CSIs, or different device plugins, and so on. It also makes it a lot easier to upgrade because you simply just replace the daemon sets for Kube proxy, for example, to a new version, and you're done. Uh, since previously, you basically had to do that manually over every single node. So this also uh, added a lot of quality of life when it comes to how you manage your Windows nodes. And of course, you can also do quite a lot of administrative tasks, like in, um, executing into the Windows nodes themselves, applying security patches, collecting logs, and so on and so forth. So they are quite useful. You can think of them as quite privileged containers. But we're not gonna talk too much about them. Uh, we have a lot of uh, documentation written on the website for this, uh, especially how you run them, how to use them, how to um, add them to your own workloads. Or, even better, you can watch Mark Rosetti's and James uh, Stuttervant's talk at the previous KubeCon uh, for this exact topic. It's a very nice, cool, uh, very nice topic, so I advise you to do so. But we're here to find out how to build those images. Well, basically you can use as a base image any other Windows image. There's no issue in that. 
But there is a special image which is only seven or eight kilobytes in size, which is a lot smaller than your typical Windows image. So, you know, why not use it? But you're gonna have to use Docker Buildx to build those images. But the build process itself is very straightforward. You, this is basically a sample taken from the QProxy um, host process container. It's just your regular from instruction and you just add a few bits and pieces there. So that's not uh, very complicated as you can see. And you just push it and you can deploy it on any Windows machine and it will run as intended. There are a couple of things which you're gonna have to take into account when deploying them. But you can simply check the documentation how to properly, uh, prop, um, properly deploy host process containers. Now for the regular container images. Um, in the start, when we started adding support for Windows images, we started building our own images and pushing them to our registries before we could actually promote them to the regular Kubernetes registries. We started with some Windows build nodes. Uh, as an example here, we have a Windows Server 2022 and the latest Docker version, or among the latest ones. And we used this node to build Windows images. So far, so good. It doesn't look amazing from any point of view, but things are going to be uh, getting complicated very soon. So this simply works. And we can also build different uh, images for different OS versions. We are built here for 2022, and we built here for 2019, because you might have users which have different Windows nodes. So until here, everything went as expected. But things start to go wrong when you try to do things which are a bit more complicated, uh, even something as trying to run something. So what's gonna happen if we try to build a Windows image for 2019 on a 2022 build node? We're gonna see that it cannot run the command. It says that um, the container operating system does not match the host operating system. That was an issue. That basically meant that we could only uh, build images for 2022 on 2022 nodes and 2019 on 2019 nodes. And at one point, we had four different OS versions which were supported uh, simultaneously, so it became quite a hassle to manage every single one of them. There must be a better way to do it. To do it. Of course, you could try to use Hyper-V isolated containers, but depending on the public cloud that you're using, that might actually be a larger flavor and extra money um, uh, that you would pay for every single instance. Alternatively, there's a better solution for this, and that would be multi-stage Docker files. So this basically doubled in size. Uh, we see that's uh, multi-stage because there are two from instructions over there. So two halves. Now, uh, the interesting part uh, about this is the fact that the first half, you can consider it like a workbench. You spawn an image which matches the build nodes OS version and you do all your things preparing the binaries and whatever you need in that side. And then in the later stage, you just copy your build product, your build binary into your final image and you publish that one. It's basically working on a workbench, taking your build uh, application, putting it in a box, adding labels, all that fancy stuff and you push the package and you leave the workbench behind. Pretty much how this works. And we can see that we, have, we no longer have any issues building 2019 images on 2022 build nodes. So that was nice, but uh, we still had to use Windows nodes to incorporate them into the Kubernetes image building processes, which was a bit more difficult. So we basically had to go back to the drawing board and try to find a solution to build Windows images from a Linux build node. Uh, we were told it was impossible. Uh, uh, we said, bet, challenge accepted. And we tried to find a solution for that. We already kind of have an idea on how to do those. An idea would be to use multi-stage Docker files once again. But for this scenario, we're gonna have to use Docker buildx or buildkit. So you're gonna have to also bootstrap it. 
But there are a couple of things which are special when you try to build Windows images on Linux nodes. First of all, do keep in mind to use the latest versions, otherwise you're gonna face quite a lot of hurdles, which we hit uh, trying to build those images. First of all, which was very interesting to find out, was the fact that when you were using Docker Build X uh, on Linux, it would overwrite the Windows images path environment variable to a Linux one. So of course nothing works afterwards, <laughs> so that was fun. And um, of course, there were a couple of other issues. You couldn't really change the user or the work, uh, work gear uh, in the Windows image. That has been fixed. And also, the OS version was not being included into the image that you were building, which is extremely important because that's how the container runtimes know which image to pull from a manifest list. It's gonna match the platform, the, um, the CPU architecture, and the OS version. But now it is included by default, so even better. You won't have as many issues uh, trying to build Windows images. Next, um, we, there's an important thing to note. You cannot store Windows images into the Linux image database. Some Kubernetes image building processes were doing that. Uh, that's basically impossible. You effectively lose the image once the docker build dex command finishes. So that was not useful. So you can solve that by simply pushing directly to the registry or saving it into a tar file or an OCI file, and which you can later on upload manually if needed. But there was another fun discovery to, to see. You, know, you had to push it to actually not lose the image. And um, another thing which occurred more recently, recently Docker Build X would generate a manifest list by default which can be problematic if you try to build multiple images and then finally create a manifest list with all your built images. Uh, this argument will prevent that issue, so another good thing to note. And this is a weird thing, it still happens to this, to this day. Simlings do not work in the way you expect them to, uh, and definitely you won't be able to use absolute paths for simlings. But you could use um, uh, relative paths for simlinks. The idea is that it, it prepends files back, backslash to any simlink target. If you have an absolute path, it generates something like files backslash C column backslash. That doesn't make any sense. But you could use relative uh, paths as shown in example. And we use stuff like this in our case. Still hasn't been uh, resolved. There's an issue open for this. So someday. <laughs> so let's see the same image, how we would do it uh, in a Linux node. The second half is the same. That didn't change in any shape or form. The first stage changed a bit because now we're using a Linux image as our workbench, to say so. So of course, we cannot execute the busybox.exe binary. That's a Windows binary, so we cannot do anything. But we are essentially doing the same thing that command we had before. Um, we're doing this manually. Of course, you can also have uh, cross-building um, steps. For example, you can simply build Windows binaries on our Linux node anyways. So you can in include those steps there. And finally, you can just copy the binaries to the Windows stage. So there are quite a lot of ways to solve this issue. So it's not a difficult thing to do. So we see here an example. We can see we are using the flags that we mentioned. We have the provenance flag, we have the platform, and we have the output set to push, push to registry. And we have the arguments over there. Yep. So this works for a lot of images. Not all of them, but most of them. There were a couple of cases in which this wasn't as easy to do. It wasn't quite feasible. For example, we had to change something very essential for the pause image. Uh, and there was no pleasant way to do that. And we essentially had to build an intermediary image which was then built uh, periodically and published and thus being used as a base for the pause image. Uh, essentially, for example, if you try to modify the registry keys in a Windows, in Windows container, that's gonna be a, a bit more difficult. You might want to use a Windows build node for that instead of publish an intermediary image instead. So 
there are certain cases which are not as pleasant to do. So there are a couple of things which uh, we were using that um, technique. Um, next, manifest lists. They are awesome. Uh, they're extremely useful to group your images into the same registry name and tag. So this is even more useful for the um, Windows images because you can bundle win multiple Windows images for multiple versions. And then basically the um, uh, container runtime will gonna, is going to pull the right image based on its own OS, host OS version. So this makes deploying applications a lot easier and smoother for your users, essentially. <coughs> Creating manifest lists is very straightforward. It's something that uh, you've probably done before anyways. One thing to note is that you have to make sure that the OS version is included for the Windows images in the JSON, which is gener generated. It should be added uh, if you're up to date, but if not, uh, it's easy to add it uh, manually with uh, docker manifest annotate command. Simply fetch the OS version and add it, and that's going to be enough, and you'll be able to push, the, push it to the registry. So, nano-server-based images. I don't know if you noticed, but Windows Server Core images, which have been used in uh, those examples, are quite large. They are something like 4.5 or uh, 4, 4 gigabytes in size, so not small which basically means that your clients are gonna spend more time pulling that first image for the first time, so they're gonna be stuck in panning for longer. Additionally, one other thing to note is that Microsoft publishes uh, updates for their images periodically, monthly, and they override the same tags. For, this, for example, LTSC 2022 is being updated monthly. This can cause some issues especially if uh, you're trying to build multiple images at different times, which basically means you're gonna have duplicates of the same Windows Server Core image for different client images, to say so. We had some issues regarding that, especially when it comes to the CI, which we use uh, for Kubernetes in test grid. And of course, you also have more storage being used. But not all images require to have such a large image. You can simply use the nano-server image for certain scenarios. And it's a lot smaller. It's something like 300 megabytes in size, which is sufficient. For example, the pause image is essentially a nano-server image. So you don't have to wait as long to you know, start your environment. And again, the issue that we faced um, in our CIs for SIG Windows is the fact that uh, we had the support for test images for, uh, for the CIs in, in Kubernetes, but they were built at different times. They were built on pull request and published at a, let, at a later date. So most of the times the images had different bases and tests would fail because you would time out pulling the image every single time. So the CIs were quite unstable because of that. But after we switched to nano-server images, we stopped having those issues. It's a lot more reliable and stable. So this uh, cool thing that uh, we had to discover. But there are a couple of restrictions when it comes to nano-server images. They're not going to work the same way as a server core. And there might be some caveats which you might have to know if you try to target this specific base. First of all, you cannot run 32-bit applications in nano-server because the compatibility layer has been removed, so you don't have that anymore. So that's one of the reasons why the image is so small. Additionally, um, some DLLs are not present in the nano-server image. Another thing which we had to discover, um, for example, net advanced, netapi32.dll doesn't exist, which basically meant applications like Nginx or CoreDNS could not work since they required uh, some networking DLLs. And we had to figure out what DLLs to include. Uh, we had to do a bit of digging. There's an awesome guide over there, which um, teaches you very well how to hunt for those DLLs. Uh, it's using Procmon. Essentially, you spin up a, um, a container trying to run the applications, and you can basically see what DLLs are being loaded by that um, container in that application. So 
Essentially, what we ended up doing is include those DLLs from server core images. You can still do that. And we still have nano server based images for applications such as Nginx, for example. So we simply fetch those binaries or DLLs from uh, the server core image. But again, we're basically pulling a 4.5 gigabytes image to simply copy a file. That's not efficient. And we used some small caches here and there to cache those binaries and DLLs uh, in a scratch image which would be updated uh, periodically with new versions. And we use that scratch image to get the DLLs. So again, instead of pulling 4.5 gigabytes of storage to get one file, multiply that by four because we're supporting four different OS versions of Windows, that ramped up the build time quite a lot. But this solved that issue. And basically, the, the cache looks something like this. We are pulling the server core image, and we're just storing it locally in a scratch image. Um, if you want to see more um, actual ways that we build those images, uh, you can simply check the, the pose image make file, which already has all the paths for building the Windows images. You can check the um, Kubernetes test image building process, which already contains a lot of uh, pointers regarding uh, building Windows images, which we have written. And you can also check the Kubernetes test image building script, which again builds a lot of images for including Linux, including Windows, and so on. And if you want to see a more complicated uh, Docker file, we didn't see anything which is complicated, check out the BusyBox one, which we use in the CI. It's a lot bigger and more complex. Now another cool tool uh, which we are using and want to talk about uh, would be Crane. This is a very interesting tool. It allows you to do a lot of things without having to pull images. But one of the use cases that we had to use it for was the fact that building Q-proxy images was a bit more difficult in the Kubernetes space because they were essentially storing the Q-proxy image locally. And then it was, they were trying to load the image into the Docker image database, which of course you cannot do. You encounter that sort of error. So the question was, OK, uh, we have the Windows image built here, but how do we push it? And we found Crane, which essentially just pushes the image without having to load, load it. So that solved our problem. But it has a few other use cases, which I think that they're pretty nice and, and uh, might be worth considering. For example, um, you can potentially use Crane to speed up your image building process, because in most scenarios, for your Windows images, you are just adding new stuff to a base image. You can simply use Crane Rebase to essentially pick up those new layers and apply them to a new base. Essentially, something like uh, Git Rebase works in the same manner. And you can simply just uh, generate new images with this command without having to pull anything. Because essentially, what is an OCI image is just a bunch of JSONs with references to images. So why pull the entire image? And uh, another thing which might be useful is, as I mentioned, Windows updates their images periodically with new security updates, which are very important. You could use Crane Rebase to essentially rebase your images to the latest security patch. And also make sure that you have the same base for all your images. So you're not going to use the same amount of storage anymore. So that was a quick deep dive into how we build uh, Windows images. Basically, we didn't try to rock the, rock the boat too much. It was a lot easier to use whatever um, build processes they already had. So that's also made, made it a lot more cost efficient because we didn't have to spin up any Windows machines to build Windows nodes, uh, build Windows images. Finally, uh, I would like you to offer this window of opportunity to join SIG Windows. Um, you can uh, check our uh, community page, uh, follow our contributor guide, join our meetings, which they are every Tuesday at 12.30 EST. 
and join our pay extensions afterwards, especially if you are new to the community. Uh, if you need any help, especially with Windows build, uh, image building, I'll be there. Um, especially uh, if you could use Windows, try it. Uh, try to find some interesting use cases on documentation. If you have any issues, please open a, an issue and maybe send some pull requests if needed. You can reach out to us. Um, to the chairs, to Arvind, um, Putia Parambil, sorry, Marcus Zetti, Armin, Naben, myself, and James Stuttervant. Join the SIG Windows Slack channel, join the mailing list. You can see the previous SIG Windows meetings uh, over there. And here is the Zoom meeting li link. We'd like to also thank uh, our contributors, past and present, and most notably, um, Ye Chang for the work for cert reloading for GMSA webhooks, Mateus Loscott for the um, work on um, SIG Windows dev developer tools, Tatenda Zifuzzi uh, for SIG Windows, uh, operational, operation, um, Windows operational readiness, sorry, uh, Vini, Vinicius Apolinario for the Windows Minikube guide and presentation that he made, and Pedro Coutinho for the work for Windows Calico CNI. That was all. Thank you very much for the attention. We, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes. Uh, one second. So uh, one essential tool for uh, package building in Linux is the package manager. Mm -hmm. And Windows recently, or recently, uh, the last years, um, also introduced WinGet for clients. Is also what's useful for container building in Windows, or is this just more client-focused? Uh, you mean build kit or what? Uh, Winget. Winget. Uh, didn't use Winget. Yeah. Or did you use any others like Choclac or? Yeah, we didn't. I mean, basically you would be running Windows commands in that scenario. So you would have to use a Windows stage for that. Hmm. Essentially, uh, Winget or Chocolatey would essentially just install a couple of binaries in places. You would have to do those steps manually, especially if you would use a Linux build node. But essentially, you could do the same work in the Linux uh, build node. Or again, uh, Windows multi-node, especially since recently we have added uh, support for Windows build kit. So you can also use Windows build X and build kit on Windows. And it has a few other, uh, other features which are not included in the Linux one, especially when it comes to switching users and changing file permissions for different files that you would have um, on, the, on your Windows container image. But yeah, that's an interesting idea. Might look into it. So I haven't personally used this crane rebase command, mm. but could you theoretically also rebase, for example, a LTSC 2019 image onto LTSC 2021 and yeah. basically, you know, combine them into the same manifest and uh, Yes, uh, that is correctly right. And I think that's what we also did here. I th uh, basically, we oh, built yeah. uh, um, an image, basically 2019, and we set the new base to be 2022, and added a, a new tag, essentially. But yes, that's what uh, we, we were mentioning. You can use to you know, not have to build uh, the same image twice, essentially. But Very yes. useful, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, he's saying that uh, it's only copying the, the, the top layer. Not uh, necessarily. It copies, it basically needs a reference to the old base. 
so it knows which layers to remove and which so basically it moves those old layers and you are left with the layers which are added newly to the image and those layers are getting appended to the new base so not only the top layer any number of layers which have been added to the base so essentially quite like git rebase because you also rebase a lot of commits in git right relations between those layers that you have to take care of. It's okay, of course, if you just copy a binary part of the layer, then it doesn't matter, but hmm. there may be more complicated operations here. Um, I don't think changing, it's going to work ch for... Changing, hmm. changing other places, yeah. So I don't think it's going to work for every single uh, case, but uh, in most cases, OCI images are just uh, a list of tar files which are overlaid one, of, uh, one on top of each other. So essentially just applies the same tar layers over a different base. So that can still work as intended. Now I think if you try to manipulate something essential to the base layer itself, for example, if you try to change some registries, I don't think in that case is going to work with uh, crane rebase. So yes, there might be those possibilities. In any case, all images that you build should essentially be also tested. And especially if you have some integration tests which you can run, those are still recommended in any case. Even if you use traditional building images uh, techniques or use something like crane rebase or Docker build X and so on. But yes, there, there might be some cases which is not feasible. Just a quick question. Yeah. Throughout this pretty incredible process, um, have you ever looked at PowerShell core between both operating systems? Uh, <laughs> we did. Sorry, somewhat of a loaded question. <laughs> it is. Uh, so, PowerShell. Huh? So, <laughs> we do include PowerShell in the test images that we build because we need it for some tests because there are some execs for some reason. And of course, Nano Server doesn't have any PowerShells in it, but you could just pull them and add them to the Nano Server image so you could still have PowerShell. One other thing which uh, kind of happens is that when PowerShell runs for the first time, it also pulls and updates its caches, which was another interesting thing because we had to use an intermediary, intermediary Windows image which already had all those caches built and set. And we are using that cache image to essentially add PowerShell and all its caches to the test images that we use. So we do use PowerShell in our scenarios. I don't know if that uh, was the question that you asked, though. You answered it. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For the server core and the nano core images, do you support the platform type of ARM with Windows? ARM? That's a good question. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I did some digging some time ago and I inspected the images that were published by Microsoft. And they were indeed manifest lists, which also included ARM images. But I didn't use ARM images because I do not have any ARM to actually test it. But the image building process would be pretty much the same in any scenarios. Because one other thing which uh, BuildKit does and is being used is it's also emulating other platforms of CPUs. For example, BuildKit is being used to build images for uh, AMD64, uh, S390X, uh, ARM, ARM64, PP. C uh, 64 LE, something like that. So in all cases uh, for Kubernetes in general, it builds a lot of images for a lot of platforms. And in the end, we'll just create a manifest list, which includes all the platforms in that manifest list. It essentially uses uh, Q QMU to emulate those platforms, 
which is another interesting issue that we faced at one point, and it was kind of hard to actually figure out this was happening, was that sometimes the image building process would fail um, in Kubernetes. And we didn't really know why. It suddenly says, I cannot build the same image anymore. I could discover the fact that uh, what happens sometimes, the same um, image jobs would be scheduled to the same node at the same time. But whenever QM was being used to mock a different platform, it would essentially change the kernel. So flags in kernel, which is the same as the host itself. So basically, it was a risk condition between two building jobs, and they were both overriding the same, uh, the same flags for the operating system. So of course, if you try to build an ARM64 and uh, AMD64 image at the same time, one of them is going to fail. That was interesting to discover, but again, uh, it's possible to build any sort of image for any uh, platform. And yes, I saw some R64 images some time ago. Uh, I think we have to finish here. But if you have any qu other, other questions, uh, feel free to ask. I'll be around here, uh, either around or outside. But thank you so much for your attendance. <laughs>